We're continuing with our uh, theme this morning in the book of Philippians, and to, today's title is Keep Pressing On, and Chris is going to read uh, from Philippians 3 verse 12 for us. Um, can I suggest that you follow it uh, in your Bibles if you've got one um, um, near you? So it's page 1180 of the Church Bibles. And if you can continue to have your Bibles open as we go through the, uh, the passage, that would be great too. Thank you. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Following Paul's example. <clears throat> All of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For well, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live life as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await the saving from there the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friend. So, keep pressing on. I wonder how many of you remember the famous film, Chariots of Fire? I, I suspect if you were over 50, you will have seen it at least once, or anyway, uh, be familiar with the, with the grand theme of the music. It features two famous athletes of the 1920s, Harold Abrahams and Eric Little. Eric Little was a committed Christian who subsequently gave his life for the gospel in China. And you'll probably remember that the climax of the film is the 440 yards final in the 1924 Olympics, when Little is pushed off the track as the bunched group of athletes approaches the first bend. Many athletes would have given up then, but no. Little was quick as a flash back on his feet, and as though supercharged, caught and, and ran up and overtook the uh, pack of athletes to win the race on the line. What a fantastic finish. Most of us would, I suspect, have given up too in that situation. But no, it was as though Little had been reading this passage of Paul's. Forget what's behind, strain every nerve to go for what's ahead, and target the finishing post. There are several very memorable um, translations or renditions of this passage. And I want to focus uh, for, for the first part on the first three verses, verses 12 to 14. And I think these will help it to come alive. So in the NIV, which we read earlier, not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward for what is ahead, I press on towards the goal 
to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And then in J.B. Phillips' rendition, uh, and as I picked up my ancient copy of J.B. Phillips, this was heavily underlined from my youth. I think this was a passage that God has spoken to me on occasions before this. I do not consider myself to have arrived spiritually, nor do I consider myself already perfect. But I keep going on, grasping ever more firmly that purpose for which Christ Jesus has grasped me. I concentrate on this. I leave the past behind, and with hands outstretched to whatever lies ahead, I go straight for the goal. And then thirdly, the message. I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I have it made, but I'm well on my way, reaching out to Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this. Unless it's Paul speaking, remember. But I've got my eye on the goal, where God is beckoning me onwards to Jesus. I'm off and running, and not turning back. Now I think there's something in there for everybody in terms of um, identifying with what Paul is saying there. So can I suggest uh, you perhaps look up or memorise whatever version perhaps especially speaks to your heart uh, for difficult and encouraging days and, and for times perhaps when you just feel like coasting or even giving up. There's a football analogy in here too. Do you get fed up, as I do, with see, seeing teams constantly passing the ball backwards and forwards in front of the opposing team's mass penalty areas, or even um, passing backwards regularly? Safety first football. Because no one is making a run. There's no one to pass to. And you want to shout at the TV, or if you're at Port Monroe. In fact, you don't need to shout at Port Monroe because they're not doing that anymore. They're scoring <laughs> goals like, like crazy at the moment, so that's great. Um, but that's what it's all about, shots on target, and that's one of the key indicators that the pundits use. It's so easy, isn't it, when you're a spectator? Harder to go for goal in the Christian life, as Paul presses us to do. So let's just take a few moments before we dive in uh, to refresh ourselves about the context of this passage. John Bates took the first half of chapter 3 three weeks ago, we learned about Paul's testimony, a Pharisee and a Jewish leader who had all the advantages of birth, all the advantages of intellect to make him stand out and give him respect and adulation within his own community. But once he met the living Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road, he gave it all up. He says he considers it mere garbage, because knowing and following Jesus was from then on supremely the most important thing in his life. He aspired to share in Jesus' death and resurrection, whatever that might mean for him personally. And remember, he's in prison, um, awaiting that final judgment. He recognises at the beginning of, these pas of this passage that he's not already achieved those things. Um, he's not already uh, there but he is determined to press on and make them his own. So let's ask, what steps and commitments do we need to make to press on with Jesus? Firstly, leaving the past behind, as we've already said this morning. Paul had certainly committed to do this, as we've seen. As the song, Kendrick's song we sung three weeks ago goes, All I once held dear, built my life upon, all I once thought gain, I have counted loss. Knowing you, Jesus, is what it's all about. At any age, but perhaps especially as we get older, it's so easy to hold on to things that may hold us back from pressing on for that goal. Maybe there are attitudes and habits that we've adopted over the years, which we know in our hearts are not really where God wants us to be but we find it very difficult to surrender them and leave them with him. We may have felt God speaking to us in the past about something, uh, but we've ignored it until the voice has gone away. We've delayed making a decision and things may have drifted. 
There may also be regrets and disappointments that we've held on to, even anger with God about the way things have turned out for us. Failed marriages and relationships, children that have not followed God's way, opportunities that have been lost to go the way we know in our hearts God wants us to go. I've just finished reading a book about failure. Well, that sounds a bit dismal, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's, it's a great book. It's called Failure, What Jesus Said About Sin, Mistakes and Messing Stuff Up. <laughs> and it's by Bishop Emerinson, who's the Archbishop of Canterbury's chaplain. We may feel that we're failures. Um, most, if not all of us, do from time to time, and some of us perhaps nearly all the time. Well, that's a common part of human experience. Yet, some people never get past specific failures in their lives, whether a moral failure or a career choice, a relationship, or a project of some kind, a business perhaps, that has gone badly wrong. Sometimes we prefer not to speak in terms of success or failure. In the foreword to the book, uh, the Archbishop Justin Welby says, He's been advised not to do this many times. People have said, don't set a target or a goal, we might not meet it. Yet that's not the way the Bible speaks, or is the fruit of human experience. The Bible faces the reality of failed lives again and again, from Jacob to Joseph, David, or the people of Israel in the Old Testament. The disciples of Jesus, Peter, whom we highlight at Easter time, even Paul's career as a Pharisee, and since that time as an apostle too, when he talks about his relationships, for instance, or his regret about his relationships with the Corinthian church. Failure is human, inevitable, and universal. The question is what we do with it. And even more important, what God does with it in partnership with us. There is a maxim in business known as Cantor's Law, after the professor who developed it. In the middle, everything looks like failure. So in the space which we as Christians inhabit, before Christ's final victory is known, a lot of things might look like failure to us. But if we judge ourselves or judge others, only by when we fall, then all of us will be consumed by a sense of despair. Even the most spectacular disappointments or failures, public or private, are not the end of the story. The end of the story is written by God. So we know, and we're assured from Scripture, that we can leave our seeming failures behind, whether recent or a long time in the past, knowing that as we've reminded ourselves as we've been around the Lord's table, that God forgives. He casts our sin, Isaiah says, into the depths of the sea, and as Corrie ten Boom famously said, puts a sign up saying, no fishing. If he has forgiven me, should I be reluctant to forgive myself? Similarly, perhaps we too need to forgive others deep in our hearts, if we're still holding any grudges or resentments. So, we need to start this new spiritual journey by leaving the past behind, and knowing that with the Lord, as we've sung, the future is always good, so good, whatever stage we've reached on life's journey. Secondly, Paul encourages us to keep persevering. Perseverance is not a very exciting word, is it? We'd love to be able to sit back and see God do wonderful things and give amazing answer to prayer. But the Christian life is not like that day in, day out. God's, God used Paul to do miracles and to preach the gospel powerfully, but it was not without much opposition, much personal suffering and spiritual warfare along the way, and sometimes we conveniently forget that. He was only too well aware of the danger of coasting or marking time, and he makes that point again in verse 16. He said, we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Are we holding on to the progress that we've already made? 
It's the old picture, isn't it, of riding a bicycle up a hill, not an electric bike, I hasten to add. <laughs> if you don't keep pedalling, you'll fall off or, or slip over backwards or do something drastic. Our relationship with Jesus and the spiritual progress we have made needs to be nurtured daily. As we pray and read the scriptures, as we worship with our fellow believers and enjoy fellowship and mutual support. If we neglect these things, we will find it harder and harder to live a disciplined and fruitful Christian life and to maintain our walk with Christ. Paul says, or the writer of the Hebrews says, don't give up meeting together as is the habit of some. The good news is that we don't have to do this on our own or in our own strength. Paul says that he presses on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Brothers and sisters, we're not on our own in this battle. As we seek to lay hold of the Lord and all his promises to us and the future held out to us, he assures us of his presence through his Holy Spirit at all times. The motto of Spurgeon's College, which trains Baptist ministers, is et tenio et tenior, which is Latin for I both hold and am held. And the logo shows an outstretched hand around the cross. As we trust in Christ's salvation for us, achieved by his death on the cross, as we focus on over Easter and hold by faith, he will hold us close to him. He'll give us all that we need to withstand temptations, trials and difficulties of every time, of every kind. We're all prone to discouragement, aren't we, at different times? I know that many of us experienced that during the pandemic. So when as a church we face the difficulties of attracting families and young people, our congregation is ageing and some of us no longer have the energy we once had. We can be tempted to discouragement and even to despair. As we've already heard on earlier sermons in, in Philippians, and we'll hear again in chapter 4, Paul encourages us to rejoice in the Lord, whatever our circumstances. The psalmist says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Paul would say that we need to take our eyes off our problems and concerns and focus on knowing Jesus, bringing everything to him and trusting that he will hold us firmly in his grip. Our thoughts and prayers go with our young people and children and grandchildren who will be taking exams in the next few weeks. They'll probably be given a revision timetable and the parents will be nagging them and encouraging them them to keep their noses to the grindstone. That's most of them anyway. <laughs> uh, there are more distractions available now than ever uh, before at the click of a button or even a voice command. It's so easy to get distracted, isn't it, when focus and concentration are really needed. Um, and don't those distracting voices come when we want to sit down and spend time with God? In our hectic lives, there are so many things we could be doing which seem of greater priority than carving out time for prayer and reading the scriptures. There are so many other activities for families to do on a Sunday, and, no, and not just families, but meeting for worship and fellowship can be something uh, that can be done when there is something, nothing better to do. So let's not be distracted from enjoying our relationship with Christ by things which may seem important in themselves, but can sap our energy and its spiritual vitality. So thirdly, let's keep the end in view. Paul talks about pressing on to reach the end of the race in receiving the heavenly prize in verse 14. What does he mean by that? He, expl he explains further towards the end of the passage that uh, Chris read in verses 19 and 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. What a prospect, what an expectation. A few years ago, Dr. R.T. Kendall, who for many years was pastor of Westminster Chapel in 
at the West End of London, wrote a book called It Ain't Over Till It's Over. It's based on a famous catchphrase by an American baseball great called Yogi Berra. And uh, R.T. Kendall's goal in writing that book was that all Christians, particularly those in their latter years, should finish well. He provides a contemporary roadmap showing the rewards of perseverance in many areas of our lives and how we can finish well like the Apostle did, with few regrets. Paul says right at the very end in 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Pray God that each one of us will be able to say that. Tom Wright says, true maturity, Paul insists, actually means knowing that you haven't arrived spiritually and that you must still keep pressing towards the goal. Can I ask then, are you discouraged or have you even given up hope? Perhaps God doesn't seem as real as perhaps he once did and you despair of seeing God answer some of the most heartfelt prayers of your life. One of the greatest strategies of the enemy is to convince us to give up on our faith. If he can't succeed in that, he may try to persuade us to settle for less than God has for us. As we've said that the pandemic was a difficult time for us all, and it's been difficult again to regain our momentum as a church. We long to see our baptistry open again, and to see people of all ages come to faith and others to have their faith re-energised and know a fresh experience of the Holy Spirit in their lives. That's all of us. Do we sometimes become half-hearted or lacking conviction or perseverance in our praying? Can I challenge myself and all of us this morning on this? Do we believe that the Gospel message still has the same power to save and transform lives? Do we believe that? Yeah, I hope we do. Are the family members we've been praying for, including our own parents, sons, daughters, grandchildren, and our praying has got less persistent and less expectant as they continue to seem resistant to God's work? There are many stories of prodigals who have come to the Lord or come back to the Lord even at a late stage in their lives. Marriages that have been repaired and saved. Other answers to prayer in remarkable ways, as people in our fellowship have testified from time to time. There's an old hymn which often used to be sung at baptismal services, and I know most of the older friends will know it well. O oh Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. And it finishes, O oh, give me grace to follow my master and my friend. Through all the temptations and difficulties and trials of life, it was easy to sing fervently in full commitment when we were younger, but can we still sing it with meaning and passion in our middle years or our old age, when we've experienced setbacks, disappointments and adversity? Let's go back to where we started, perhaps, to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of us. I'm reminded of what Paul said to Timothy near the end of his life while in a prison cell in Rome. I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. God is to be completely trusted and will be faithful to keep all his promises to us. The Greek in which this was originally written can also be rendered, he is able to guard what he has entrusted to me. I have entrusted to him, he has entrusted to me. Once we have trusted Christ as Saviour, we're kept by his power, and he'll never let us go, even if we don't follow as closely as we should. In the same way, he will enable us to dis discharge those responsibilities we've been given, to love, bless, pray for, and encourage others, as well as our own particular giftings. There are strong ministries of prayer and encouragement that can be exercised, even in old age. The tra tragedy is that if our love grows cold and we limp over the line, as it were, we miss out on so much that God has for us. 
you remember John Bates was saying three weeks ago that he and Jan thought they'd retired nine years ago when they left <laughs> full-time ministry. But God has still so much more for them to do. As Norman Harris, the previous minister, used to say, I would rather burn out than rust away. <laughs> as the song we sometimes sing says, I want something that will last when your holy fire comes. Something that will last and to hear you say, Well done, giving glory to you, Lord. Is that your prayer this morning? So as we draw to a close, let's remind ourselves of the glorious heritage we have as sons and daughters of the King. He will transform our lowly bodies so that they become like his glorious body. What a prospect and one we find difficult to comprehend with our finite minds. We see a glimpse of what this might be like in the resurrection appearances of the risen Jesus, recognisable as the same person with the same bodily characteristics but somehow different. A body totally renewed and not subject to the human limitations we currently have. One thing is sure, we won't be disembodied spirits sitting on a cloud somewhere in an ethereal heaven, but recognisable personalities transformed into the likeness of Christ, worshipping and serving in the new heaven and the new earth which he has promised. What a hope and what a prospect. So to summarise as we close, let's leave the past behind knowing that God forgives and strengthens and renews us every day as we lean on him. Let's persevere even through the difficult times in our own life and in our life together as a fellowship. And finally, let's press on and keep the end in view. God has so much more in store for us and it's all good.